In our last session, we saw how the whole question of metaphysics is interconnected with the science of epistemology. How do we know what's really out there? And I showed the strengths and weaknesses of deduction and induction. And we ended up by looking at another problem that the philosophers of the 18th century and the scientists of the same era were encountering, namely, the world was growing bigger, and yet, from a different perspective, the world was growing smaller. I think about this sometimes on the golf course. I've had many experiences where I've hit my tee shot where you're not supposed to hit your tee shot, in the rough, and I'll find my ball and I'll see that in order to advance from where I am to the green, I have to negotiate a great big tree that's blocking my avenue to the green. And I don't know how many times I've been playing golf and, and I'll look at my situation, I'm trying to figure out how to invent a shot to go around the tree, either this way or that way, or cut the ball and hit it over the tree, because I know I can't hit it under the tree, although I can hit it under the branches if I hood the club face and hit a low shot. I mean, do that sort of thing. But as I'm sitting there, you know, pondering my problem, invariably, who's ever playing golf with me will say, oh, R.C., go ahead, just hit it. Trees are 90% air anyway. Have you ever heard that expression? Trees are 90% air. I don't know whoever did the percentage analysis of the makeup and composition of trees that are in the rough at the golf course, but I hear this axiom all the time. They're 90% air. And then I have my Colombo routine and I say, well, just a minute, there's one thing I don't understand here, and that is, how's come I can't hit the ball from here towards that tree and get through it 90% of the time? <laughs> it doesn't, sure doesn't seem like 90% of that tree is air. Well, actually, if we got technical about it, we would have to conclude that the figure 90% is really not an accurate estimate of the substance of that tree. In fact, it would be way too small. Did I say too small? Or did I mean too high? No, I mean too low. At least in terms of modern theories of matter and of substance we have what we call the atomic theory of reality. And we say that all these things, including the trees, are made up of these tiny little bits of atoms which you put the atoms together and they'll make molecules and so on. But recently I read a book on, on physics which was trying to give us some idea of what an atom looks like. And you've all seen the models of atoms that look like little tops spinning. And at the center of the atom is a nucleus. And then spinning around in orbit around there are these electrons or protons or whatever they are that are flying around outside from the nucleus. And presumably, what's in between is what? Space. Not even air. Less dense than air. And the model I saw was of the area of metropolitan Los Angeles. Where they took the huge outer perimeter of the city of Los Angeles. And they said, imagine having an old VW bug that was parked in this very center of downtown Los Angeles. And there was nothing else in the city. No cars, no buildings, no people, no trees, nothing. Just this single lone little VW bug. And you don't get to anything solid or uh, material until you get out to the outer limits of the city. But everything in between, the outer limits of Los Angeles and the VW bug in the middle, is space. That was the 
image that was used to describe the composition of an atom. So obviously, this represents far less than 1% of all of this. And so if trees are 90% air, by this kind of reasoning, the city of Los Angeles is 99.9% .9 space because it's simply made up of atoms. This is what I meant when I said the world is getting smaller and smaller and smaller to us. And this compounds the problem of metaphysics. Because if I say to you that 99% of what you perceive is empty space, not a whole lot really there. Because it seems when I look at a person or I look at a, an object, a physical object, it seems to me to be 100% solid. But when we look at it under a microscope, and an atomic microscope, we find that there is precious little extension, to use Descartes' term, or solidity that's really there. Now let's make the problem even more egregious. I need some help now to give this following illustration. Roger, can you come up here and help me for just a second? I'm not going to do anything, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. I just want you to stand here and be my partner for a second. Everybody now can see my buddy Roger Amundsen. He's one of my star students in this course in philosophy. Now, I would like the audience that is here to tell me what color Roger's shirt is. How many think it's blue? You all said it's blue. Roger, they all said you had a blue shirt. You like his blue shirt? It's a nice blue shirt. Okay, see, that wasn't hard, was it, Roger? Thank you, buddy. Okay, we've all had the experience now of seeing Roger's shirt, and we all identified his shirt as being blue. Now, I can ask the question very simply, is Roger's shirt blue? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, this is what the philosophers of the 18th century we're very much concerned about. If I say Roger's shirt is blue, as soon as I use the word is, I'm using a form of the verb to be. I am predicating to his shirt something about its being. I'm saying that the being or the essence of this shirt includes, whatever else it includes, the quality of blueness or color. Now suppose we turned out all the lights in here and, in, and added to that, we shut it, our, we shut it. <laughs> Add to that that we shut our eyes. Would Roger's shirt still be blue? Or to put it another way, is the blueness of the shirt something that is in the shirt, or is it something that I see as blue because when light hits that object that he's wearing, certain aspects of the spectrum of light are absorbed by the material, and another aspect is reflected by the material, and I only see that element of the spectrum of light that is blue. But without the source of the light shining, there wouldn't be any color because the color's not in the shirt. The color's in the light. 
Now, I look at the shirt, and it looks like the shirt has this quality of blueness, when in fact, the blueness is not part of the essence of the shirt. And when we said the shirt is blue, at the metaphysical level, we made a mistake. Now, this is the kind of thing that John Locke and his successors were wrestling with, that the more we understood about the world outside of us, things like light and the secrets of the minute that we discover microscopically, it changes our thinking of what we believe really is out there. Now, I'm not denying that there is such a thing as light, or I'm, nor am I denying that that shirt, and when I look at it, manifests the quality of blueness. Now, again, we turn back the lecture clock a few lectures back to when we looked at Thomas Aquinas. And we looked at Thomas Aquinas's view of metaphysics, and we said at that time that according to St. Thomas, Every object is made up of its substance or its essence and its accidents. And the accidents, we said, were the external perceivable qualities. You remember that? The qualities that we observe or that we meet with our senses. Now, of course, Thomas assumed that the accidents of a thing are inseparably related, though distinguished from, its substance. Now, when John Locke was working on this question of perception and learning through the senses, he made a distinction between what he called primary qualities and secondary qualities. And the distinction was this. Primary qualities are those qualities that are really there, objectively inherent in the substance of a thing. That there are certain qualities that are found in shirts, or in chalk, or in books, or in people. One such inherent quality, going back to uh, Descartes, was the quality of extension. That all material things are extended. So all material things have the primary quality of extension. Or we can speak of hardness, but then when you get to the level of color, or taste, or aroma, these other aspects that we encounter with our five senses whenever we see something or perceive something in the external world, some of those things are added by our mind or by the presence of light or whatever. Those would be what Locke called secondary qualities, qualities that are not essential to the reality. Let me say it again. Qualities that aren't part of the essence. Just as I've said, blueness is not an inherent attribute of that shirt. Blueness is something that is added by my eye when I look at the shirt with the ad addition of light. Does everybody follow that? Okay. Now, with that discovery or with that distinction, what Locke was saying is that there are real essences there, metaphysical realities. And we perceive the substratum of being, 
we have a perception of objective reality. But that perception that we have is mixed between our perception of qualities that are really inherently in the object plus those qualities that are added by the mind or by the eyes or by the senses as we perceive. You've heard the old adage, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That is, those who argue that point say that there's no such thing as objective beauty. There may be something that is an object that I look at and you look at and I say is beautiful and you say is ugly. Because the quality of beauty is something that I am bringing to the experience and I'm making a subjective judgment or evaluation about something's beauty or ugliness. Now that's the realm of normal daily life where we meet up with this kind of philosophical problem. Now, following John Locke's work as a pioneer here, there came a very strange uh, philosopher, strange in the sense of the ideas that he represented, who was very much concerned about the growing view of people in the 17th and 18th century towards materialism and consequently toward atheism. And the man I'm talking about was a man who was a bishop of the Anglican Church. And his name was George Barclay, is how it's pronounced. Oh, I, I never spell it right. But if you look at it, you think it reads Berkeley because it's spelled like the university campus that we have in California that we pronounce Berkeley, but the pronunciation of his name is Barclay. And he was born in 1685, and he died in 1753. So his work really takes us into the middle of the 18th century. There are those, for example, who believe that Bishop Barclay's philosophy had a profound influence on America's greatest philosopher, who, of course, was Jonathan Edwards. But in any case, Barclay's concern, remember we said, if we're going to understand a philosopher, we have to ask, what problem is he trying to solve? What concern is he wrestling with? Well, being a bishop of the church, Barclay was concerned that science was moving more and more and more away from God and more and more and more towards a metaphysical view that said what is ultimately real is not God, but matter itself. And that the universe is nothing more and nothing less than a some experience of material things. And this became the bridge in Barclay's day for the whole kind of revival of atheism. And the atheist said, we don't need to postulate some supernatural spiritual being to explain the universe and to explain our significance. The only thing that is real is matter. There is no spirit. And if there is no spirit realm, then there is no room for God. So Barclay is concerned not only as a, uh, a philosopher, but chiefly as a theologian to rescue modern civilization from this rushing tide of materialism, which brings in its wake atheism. And he wants to see a scientific paradigm or model that has a real place for God. Now, we will see in our next session how Barclay approaches this problem and how he looks at the distinction that Locke made between primary and secondary qualities and how the bishop would wrestle with the question of Roger's blue shirt or my problem 
with the tree that is 90% air that I encounter on the golf course. But we'll look at that in our next session.